Hey guys, RC Peck here. Good to have you here. So on the screen, I have a chart. It's actually a Fidelity mutual fund. <laughs> and I have not liked Fidelity for a very long time. So this mutual fund is called the Fidelity Select Leisure Fund. And a couple things really struck me when I saw this price chart. One is the Fidelity Select Leisure Fund is hitting a new lifetime high. And so the first thing I thought was like, okay, if a leisure fund is hitting a new lifetime high, how how bad can the stock market be in? Like, if it's supposed to be this eminent crash happening, then how is a leisure fund hitting new lifetime highs? Like that that doesn't make sense. Either this leisure fund's gonna have to start going in the other direction because look, new lifetime highs are a sign of strength, not a sign of weakness. But then it got me thinking, <laughs> what is what is leisure? To me, leisure is like cruise ships and vacations and like stuff you don't have to buy. It's lifestyle, right? It's not living expenses. And one of the things when I with my training clients, I, I, I sometimes talk about the difference between living expenses and lifestyle, right? Living expenses are things you have to pay for even when you lost your job. And living expenses are the things you get rid of when you lose your job. So I was like, okay, well, I want to know what was in <laughs> the Fidelity Leisure. So I went to Fidelity and I looked because I wanted to see. So here's what's crazy. So 10 10 of the holdings, their top, their 10 biggest holdings, listen to this, their 10 biggest holdings, McDonald's, Starbucks, Yum Brands, Yum Brands, if you don't know, is Taco Bell and Pizza Hut, um, and Chipotle. So the, the big three are McDonald's, Starbucks, Yum Brands, then you have Royal Caribbean, then you have Hilton, which is a hotel company, but then you have Chipotle. So four of the 10, four of the 10 are... I mean, I know you want to consider Starbucks fast food, but three of them are fast food. And I just thought this is really interesting because to me, someone spending their money at McDonald's or Taco Bell, um, even Chipotle, but certainly Taco Bell or Pizza Hut or McDonald's, that's not leisure. That They're probably eating there maybe because it's the cheapest place to eat. So it just got me thinking like, what? What what is the person buying? Like I don't think people know what they're buying. They're buying based on words, right? Someone's like, oh my gosh, the leisure index. Well, if the leisure index is doing well, now, and I'm not talking up both sides of my mouth. It mouth it is doing well, but I would never consider McDonald's, Starbucks, Yum, and Chipotle leisure. Those seem more staple like. But nonetheless, I was like, okay, I wanted to dig a little bit more, and I said, well, how how good has this leisure fund done? So this is a price chart comparing the Le the Fidelity Leisure Fund, which is the red line on the screen, and I compare it against this blue line, which is just the discretionary, the consumer discretionary sector of the stock market. And I got to tell you, they look like they do about the same thing. Now, look, if you buy consumer discretionary, you buy the entire sector, you're getting hundreds of stocks. You're getting true spreading of your money it's going to be more stable and i all things being equal if two individual symbols are going to do the same thing i want the thing that is more stable and bigger because i want more stability over less stability if i if i'm going to own something with 31 stocks in it it better damn well outperform something that has multiple of that and so it was just interesting. And so to me, the takeaway was it's so easy to get hijacked by words, leisure. And even though the leisure select is making new lifetime highs, it makes more sense to me that out of its 10 biggest holdings, guys, I'm going to call Starbucks fast food, fast coffee, um, four, <laughs> well, three of them are for sure fast food. And then one Starbucks, um, Starbucks, I'm sure sells a lot of cake pops. Um, so again, we get so easily hijacked. The next thing I want to talk about is Tesla and Tesla is a fascinating company and it's really captured the hearts and minds of people. 
um, ever since it went public in 2010. And this has been a volatile, volatile stock, right? Of course, there's been people that probably bought it at $20 or at $18 where it IPO'd. But when you look at this stock, this is incredibly volatile. I mean, just, just this drop right here is a 50% drop from, call it August 2, 2014 to February 2016, right? That, that, that is a 50% drop there. The market did not drop 50%. I think during that same time period, the market was down. When I say the market, I mean the S&P 500 was down about 13%. So you have this stock that's going to be four or five X the volatility, but huge sideways. I mean, it basically went sideways for about three years in a very violent way. And then it cruised higher. But even this sideways, like you could even say it went sideways for six years in a very violent way, because then again, back here, I, I, show, I, I showed you that it dropped to 50%, but then it dropped... 55%, actually 53.7%. Let's just round and call it 54. So what I don't like about this is it's such a polarizing stock. I mean, let's set, let's set aside Elon and his own hurt little boy behavior that he um, puts on the world. Clearly super amazing guy, right? But People posture. They're like, oh, I own I own Tesla. I mean, obviously it went up here. We can see this huge spike was just um, amazingly. It to me, I mean, it's a 200% move. To me, it almost looks like a short squeeze that there were so many shorts on this that once this, the price started moving higher, the shorts had to cover. And when you short something and you want to get out of your position, you have to buy back shares. And man, that looks like a short squeeze to me. I don't know if Tesla's worth a hundred billion dollars. If it is, that means the world is pricing it as a software company and an autonomous vehicle company that is going to own that industry, which look, maybe it is, right? Tesla's got what, 550,000 vehicles on the road, recording all that learning, all that AI auto driving. So it, it could be like, yep, they figured out autonomous driving. And if they are the ones that figure out autonomous driving, then maybe that hundred billion is is kind of more in line, right? Because if you add GM and Ford's market cap together, you get something about eighty-five billion dollars. So this stock is not being priced on how many cars are being sold because they sell a fraction of what any one of those companies I just mentioned sell, it would have to be being priced that they are absolutely going to figure out autonomous driving. But again, when someone talks about this and they posture on Facebook or Instagram or wherever they posture about it, this was not and will not be an easy stock to own for quite some time, simply because if you're going to own it, are you willing to lose half of your position twice to then get that 200% return. So it's very, in, it's a very interesting, it's almost like a case study. And the other thing too, is when you, when you read these people posturing about their position in Tesla, one of the things I always want to know is what, what portion of your portfolio is that, right? So if you have a million dollar portfolio and you have $10,000 in Tesla and your other $990,000 is in cash, then really you're posturing about that. But again, we never, we'll never see that side because today in the Facebook nation, we only, people only show what they want you to see, right? It's about posturing and looking at me. All right, I got one more story for you and it came from, I, I saw this um, Twitter post from Charlie Biello. Um, I thought it was interesting. He said, returns since the first Bitcoin transaction in January 2009. So the first Bitcoin transaction happened in January 2009. <coughs> and he compared and said, this was supposed to disrupt payments, right? 
Bitcoin is going to disrupt payments. That, that was the big claim 11 years ago. And it shows a price chart of MasterCard and Visa. And so I, I, I showed, I want to get a bigger price chart of MasterCard and Visa. Now, if I were to put Bitcoin on here, it would actually crush the returns of uh, MasterCard and Visa simply because Bitcoin started at basically zero. Um, but I loved his framing, right? MasterCard's the red line and it's up about 2,000%. 2,000% since that January of 2009. So it did not disrupt MasterCard. MasterCard's up 2,000% since Bitcoin. Let's, let's just call it even gone public. Okay. And then you have that other company that does those transactions called Visa. And Visa's up 1,400%. And so... Again, this is another example of teasing out the narrative and teasing out what, what actually is going on, right? So what's actually going on is, what did Charlie say? I want to, I want to use the exact words, disrupt payments. So I don't see payments disrupted yet. In fact, I see the two biggest payment companies kind of going hockey stick up into the right. And so the, whether we talked about a leisure fund which is basically the consumer discretionary sector, but with fewer stocks, which means it's going to be more volatile or more volatility. We get hijacked by words and terms. Then you have Tesla, which people can posture about. And if they're going to posture, I'd love for them to just tell me what percentage they had, where they bought, how many times they got in and out, in and out, in and out. And I would love to understand how they've done with those other stocks they've owned where when they lost 50%, then they lost another 50%, then they lost another 50%, right? Because you never hear about that part of the story. And then the final symbol to this, you know, are you buying a narrative? Are you buying someone posturing? Are you buying a word? Is just, I don't see a lot of disruption that happened in electronic payment systems. Um, and, you know, we could put PayPal on here, too, and I'm sure that has screamed up and to the right also. And so the big takeaway, whether it, it's it's Tesla and all the posturing that's going on or someone saying Bitcoin's going to disrupt payments or you buy a fund or an ETF because of the name of it. Guys, it's so easy for our brains to get hijacked. It's so easy to be hypnotically hypnotized to fall in love with an, a narrative or a story and lose sight of the big picture. And the big picture is you follow price. Hey guys, this is just another step in helping you protect your portfolio or your future. Thanks so much for tuning in and I'll speak to you next week. All right, take care.